All right. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to the next edition of our ASES Virtual Journal Club. This one's on rotator cuff repairs. We have an awesome panel tonight. Rob Hartzler from TSAOG uh, is going to be joining with us. Um, my great partner, Okana Quincy from Duke University and Butch Krishnan um, from Baylor. We're going to be uh, discussing the, the controversial topics of uh, rotator cuff repairs. And then, you know, as always, my co-host, Matt DePaula. And we have a special guest host, uh, Pete McDonald, is going to be joining us to ask the real hard questions. So um, as always, we're going to be going doing four articles tonight. Um, they're each going to have uh, 50 minutes for discussion. Please uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll make sure to get them to um, the panelists to kind of answer the questions you all want to know. So um, without further ado, we'll get started. So the first article that we're going to be talking about is the minimum of 15 year follow up for clinical outcomes of arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. This was a study based on the concept that cuff repairs are one of the most common shoulder procedures in the country. And even though they show symptomatic relief in the short term following surgery, Retail re rates question the durability of the procedure. They hypothesize that 15 year follow up in patients who underwent all arthroscopic repair cuffs would maintain significant improvement from the preoperative status. Patients were, that were included were all arthroscopic cuff repairs performed in 60 patients from 2003 to 2005. Um, Promise scores, SANE scores, and ASC scores were um, evaluated. Patient demographics, characteristics, revision, surgical procedures, and complications were recorded. Average follow-up was 16 years. PROs, PROs improved over the study duration. Surgical repair on the dominant arm, multiple tendon involvement, tendon healing status on the ultrasound of five-year follow-up, tendon tear size, and length of follow-up were all not predictive of a PRO of, of, a, of a, um, um, uh, outcome scores. Seven underwent revision surgery. Older age and female sex were associated with lower uh, scores. And they conclude that all long-term follow-up PROs of all arthroscopic uh, procedures showed significant improvement in preoperative function. So Rob, maybe you can ask us answer the first question. Can you interpret why tendon size and healing at five years was not predictive of um, outcome measures? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, the rotator cuff, uh, you know, is a mystery, I think. And um, one of the big unanswered questions is, why do structurally failed repairs, um, you know, not always do poorly symptomatically? And we know that bigger tears fail structurally at a higher rate. Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't really know other than, you know, just to say those things about that. And it continues to mystify me why some patients that we operate on um, that, you know, do very well, even though they're their reconstructions don't heal. Okay, do you have any thoughts on the same question? No, I think uh, I, I agree with what, what he said. Obviously, we know that the um, outcomes of uh, rotator cuff repair do not always correlate with objective findings, and there are a lot of reasons why that could be the case. Certainly, you know, the force balancing and force coupling is a big, probably a big reason why. Um, you know, we know that if the tears get to a certain point, especially if the force couple is disrupted, those are patients that might be more symptomatic. Um, but for sure, we have sort of more work to do to figure out how to correlate healing to patient outcomes. All right. Pete, do you have any comments on that as well? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Matt, what about uh, your... Uh practice in rotator cuff repair, what are the critical factors postoperatively that you are think are important for a su uh, successful outcome? I'm sorry, were you directing that question at me? I apologize. Yeah, that was you. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so factors for, for, uh, for good outcome is what you're saying? Yeah. Well, certainly, ideally, we're trying to get them to heal. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was thinking when you guys were answering the question about what it takes or why some people aren't affected when their cuff heals. And I was thinking about, you know, how many muscle attachments there are to the scapula. And if, I'm, if I have my anatomy correct, I believe there's 17 different muscle attachments. And sometimes I wonder, we're not always looking at all those other muscles, you know, how is the trapezius play into things? How are the rhomboids playing into things? How are the serratus? And certainly short of a major nerve palsy, um, 
we may not totally understand how those factors are playing into it. So certainly the goal obviously is to try to get a healed cuff repair. Um, I think there's, you know, there's definitely more to it than, than getting that repair and, and, uh, getting the balance. I agree with, um, the, the previous statement about the, uh, the balance force couple. Um, it's also very patient specific. I mean, in terms of who is satisfied. So, uh, one person who's got a very high level occupation with overhead activity, uh, maybe sad or may not be as satisfied as someone else who's more sedentary. So it, it also may be very patient specific. I'm not sure if I answered the question well enough or not, but, um, uh, certainly things to think about. Yeah, certainly there's a lot we don't understand with regard to rotator cuff repair and why some patients are happy, why some compensate so well and why some don't. And, you know, this is a question we've been talking about for since I was a, a fellow and uh, we still don't have, we're not much further ahead in terms of answers. So, okay, what what are the critical factors in your practice that are important in your post-operative protocol? Do you think that the post-operative protocol actually leads to um, more success or do you think it's important in your cuff healing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think um, the answering the last question first, um, I do think it has a, a role in healing. I cannot state if it has a role, this is the PT protocol, if it has a role in sort of how patients are doing pain wise. Um, we know there's a big difference between tendons healing and patients who have pain. So my protocol for massive tears is very different from my protocol for small tears. Uh, my immobilization period is different for small tears versus large tears, et cetera. Um, in terms of the patient population, obviously historical things that we've all known, uh, patient age, younger is typically better. Uh, the amount of fatty atrophy, in my opinion, is the most important thing. Uh, if you combine the fatty atrophy, especially of the infraspinatus that's been shown uh, to be most predictive of repairability, uh, lack of osteoarthritis, Functionally, we've always said, you know, being able to elevate the arm to 90 degrees at least, so lack of pseudoparalysis, and obviously the uh, patient's protoplasm, diabetes, smoking, etc. Um, of those, I think the most important ones for me would be fatty atrophy and patient age. I'll also say that patient age has increased. I know when I was a resident, we always sort of use this number of 64 years old, and I think it was based on, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Yamaguchi's study in the past. We've seen more recent data showing that patients can do fine um, even in their 70s if they have adequate sort of muscle quality, tendon tear size, et cetera. So I don't necessarily screen out people just based on age. Now I look at the muscle quality, et cetera. So Rob, uh, do, when do you image people postoperatively? At what point, like based on, you know, if obviously if they're doing really well, you, you're not gonna image them, yeah. but if they're having issues, What's your cutoff for doing in imaging and when would you do that imaging? And how do you breach yeah. that conversation with a patient who actually may be doing reasonably well, but has a residual tear that didn't heal? Yeah, the imaging question is so, it's so vexing. I actually, I mean, I had this conversation with one of my patients today who is not doing as well as I thought about five months out afterwards. And I mean, my reading of the the published literature is, you know, just you know, tens of thousands of these repairs, you know, are done per year and over, over the years. And we have structural imaging information on post-operative on like almost none of those. And so what, I mean, my reading of the literature, which there isn't very much of is that, you know, three, three months seems to be a bad time point and, and before to re-image because, um, there are a, a significant number of false positive retears at that time point, but six months seems to be better. And then six months also seems to correlate somewhat with longer term imaging if you do serial studies. So that, so I try to make them wait six months if I, if I can, um, especially if I think that they're, you know, if they're having problems and they're stiff, then that um, correlates with healing. So I think you know, if I can just get them, you know, get them through their stiffness that they're probably going to do fine. Um, if I'm really concerned based on strength or their exam or an injury or things like that about the structural status. And, and also I think that it might be reasonable to re-operate on them in some way, um, then I'll be, you know, more prone to get it. But I mean, I think to sum up, 
I try not to get it ever because most patients, you know, as this study supports, most patients who undergo rotator cuff repair um, do well clinically, even in the face of non-healing. Um, and those repairs seem to hold up pretty well. So, well, Butch, that, that brings us to the next question then. So this study only had seven failures and reoperations over the course of a 16-year period. Butch, is that similar in your practice or what do you think of those results? No, this is a, by the way, Chris, thank you for putting together such a Great webinar, Chris, Matt, Mr. President, uh, OK, and Rob. And, uh, you know, just just a couple of things that I was listening to these in incredible comments. But, you know, I, I think that people compensate not necessarily because of what we do, but because the natural history of the human shoulders to have a cuff tear. You know, as we lose hydration in our cervical thoracic spine and start to lose our ability to control the scapular position on the body and still reach, it's like our pitchers who have very adaptive tears of the rotator cuff in acute phase over a year or two years because they're you know throwing at 95 miles an hour. The natural history by the time we're 80, 85, 90 is to adapt to rotator cuff tear. And it seems to be, at least in my practice for my patients that I've seen over 20 years that I fixed you know early in my practice and I see now 20 years later, I know they have a cuff tear and they've come to see me for something else the other side and they've compensated for it. And, you know, the, the biology for me is the most important, like Oki was saying, but I, I think the biology really needs to, um, to focus on the fact that, you know, the rotator cuff's a termite in my experience in young people, and that termite needs to go away or it's going to either burn the house down or the house is going to be a house of termites. And, uh, you know, to reoperate on only seven patients, you know, this is a really early series, you know, from HSS in the early 2000s and there were you know the age range was everywhere from you know mid 30s to what mid 70s something like that and we don't know what the techniques techniques were and we don't know more than likely there were mostly single row at the beginning maybe some double rows we don't know which grouping of patients actually had subsequent procedures whether the younger ones or the older ones it seems to be at least in my practice that if a patient comes back to see me for symptomatic failure to heal i don't call it a retear i think it's a failure to heal then they tend to be younger patients that come back sooner. And those are the ones that tend to have surgery by me. But if they're older patients, they compensate. And so, you know, I think it's, it's really individualized. Seven people had a subsequent procedure. I think that's mainly because they probably just didn't come back. And I think Rob made a really good point about re-imaging. I know we maybe are supposed to agree on this and maybe we do, but you got to realize there's a bimodal distribution for the tear, re-tear or failure to heal that we might identify post-operatively. And I like the word failure to heal because Joy Anadi has demonstrated that. There's an early failure to heal in the first 12 weeks at the tendon bone interface, the anthesis. And there's a delayed failure to heal at the muscular tendinous junction, not necessarily because it's a type two failure from a double row repair, anchorless repair, it really doesn't matter. It's just because the stress load transfers to the myotendinous junction and there's a differential load on the tendon at that time, which may transfer into a you know an abnormal, uh, it's stress on the anthesis. So, you know, imaging, uh, Dr. Matson taught me years ago, you know, the best way to ruin a good result is to re-image your patient. So, you know, I try to run away from that. And, and man, I'm going to, I invoke what Mr. President Pete says in Canada, Hey, you know, we can't image with this healthcare system secondarily it costs too much. So you can't do it in Canada. You can't do it here. eh? Yeah. Good point. I mean, where we get into trouble is that they go off to another, their family doctor or somebody else orders the imaging, even though they're doing fine. Then they come back and say, hey, I got a read chair. What should I do? It's always a difficult conversation. But anyways, that was a great discussion. Can we have, can I ask a question from, from the panel to the panel or to the, to the moderators? I mean, very, very. Patients, patients ask about how to, you know, do, will this repair last? I think, I mean, I don't get that question a ton they more they assume it's going to do well but some patients that are pretty perceptive will ask you know am I going to have to have this done again is it going to last and you know I my question is with the um, number of with the percent follow-up that we have on this can we say affirmative in the affirmative the, the repairs seem to hold or the surgery seems to do well and you won't have to have redo surgery or do we not know enough information about the long-term results because only a third of the patients you know, we're available for follow-up and we have no structural imaging data again from this study of like, how should we address that with the patients? I mean, I'll speak to it. I, I'm pretty upfront with my patients. I, I tell them all the bad and the good, and I will tell them that larger tears, especially if they're chronic, have a higher percentage of 
either re-tearing or not healing, but I'll actually explain that to them. I'll tell them that even if it doesn't, even if you do get a subsequent MRI and it shows that there's some portion of a re-tear, because we all know that if an MRI shows a re-tear, it's not always that the, the uh, or a failure to heal. Sometimes it's not the full tendon that has failed to heal. Sometimes it's partial. And the MRIs are so specific that you often have to guard against the, uh, the noise in the MRI or the over-reporting in the MRI. So I will tell them that even if you get a quote unquote failure to heal, that functionally speaking, the results are, are still often very good. And, and I, I'll just be straight up with them and tell them that indeed it is a bit of a mystery, but the analogy I use, and hopefully our resident will appreciate this analogy, I'm in Buffalo, so we're a pretty big hockey town here like they are in most of Canada. I'll tell them that the shoulder is a bit like a hockey team, that just because one of the players went out on a penalty, it doesn't mean the rest of the players quit playing the game. So the rest of the muscles are still activating and trying to make up for the loss of that one. So that's the analogy I tend to use. Um, but I'm I'm straight up with them. I don't pull any punches and I try to be give them the bad with the good. I'm learning a lot of new things tonight about rotator cuff being like a hockey team and then termites and all this stuff. Uh, all these uh, I need a little better explanation than the termite thing. Yeah, I need a little more. <laughs> It made perfect this thing, sense. This thing gets in your house. You need to get it out. I'm telling you, Clifton Hartzler. Okay, you guys have cuff tears, man. You're rushing in to get that damn thing fixed. Oh, sorry, Steve. To get the darn thing fixed, right? It's a termite. <laughs> it's a, because all we're on a delay. We've got a delay so button. I'm going to fire this up. I'm going to fire this up because I had this conversation during a panel and a meeting a couple of weeks ago. You know what we tell patients is not actually what we do for ourselves. And the reason is because we have our own shared decision-making. They can only share in the decision-making if they know what we know. So if you tell them, hey, you know what? You're you know, 42 years old and you've got a cuff tear and here's what's going to happen to your shoulder. Here's the pination angle and here is the Gerber studies and here is everything that's going to happen. Johanny O, every single one of them is going to say, book me now, right? But we don't tell them that. We're like, yeah, okay, live with it. Okay, come back if you're hurt. Yeah, whatever. Go to therapy, treat it non-operatively, read Warren Dunn's article, so on and so forth. But again, individualize the discussion and be honest with them. That's a great point. That's great points. Let's, uh, let's move. I mean, it's going to be a great discussion. I can already tell. Let's move on to the next uh, article titled the arthroscopic rotator cuff repair with and without a chromioplasty in the treatment of full thickness rotator cuff tears. It's actually Pete's study questionable ethics from his junior partner, Jared. Fraud. Fraud. <laughs> All right. So the goal of this study was to reevaluate patients uh, that were randomized from a control trial study in 2003 to 2011, which are allocated into an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair with or without a chromioplasty. Secondary, secondary data was collected between 2015 or between 2011 and 2015. Patients underwent a clinical assessment, completed a Western Ontario rotator cuff index, and filled out a questionnaire about the reoperation. The study demonstrated excellent follow-up with the majority of the chromioplasty and non-chromioplasty groups um, who were presented for evaluation. The mean duration of follow-up was 11 years. There was no significant difference in the WORC scores between the groups. Interestingly, there was a significant difference in reoperations between the two groups with 16% of patients in the non-acromioplasty group and only 2% in the acromioplasty group requiring reoperation. Of notes, all the patients who required a reoperation had type 2 or type 3 acromion. So this study concluded that patients experienced improvement in outcomes from their preoperative level, regardless of receiving acromioplasty or not. WORC scores were the same between the groups, but reoperation rates were lower in the type two and type three acromions. So, you know, this is a this is an awesome study and a great prospective study. But you know, Oki Waterman did a similar study and found that type three acromions were not associated with reoperations. Can you comment on you know how type two and type three acromions uh, impact um, reoperation rates, and what do you do in your practice when you see one of them? Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, obviously, this is a great study by uh, our president and one of many that he's done. I don't know how he does it. Um, I think one good thing about this study that I don't see in a lot of studies is just really breaking down the acromial type. Um, I think we've probably oversimplified the literature over the years and just come to a conclusion that acromioplasty just don't matter. Uh, I think this study sort of shows that it probably does matter more than we think. Um, I'm not surprised that uh, Waterman's study sort of found different, different results. I think their breakdown of um, the Biliani types were different than this study. And also, 
I think you need a large number of patients and studies to really come to some sort of conclusive evidence. Um, but I for sure think in my patient practice, if a patient has a type two, especially a type three, for sure they're gonna get an acromioplasty. Um, I think we still don't know, you know, Dr. Biliani really felt strongly about impingement and being the cause of rotator cuff tears. And now we think a bit more about the biology slash impingement. And I think there are certain biological factors that lead to termites. And sometimes termites are caused from, you know, impingements and it's sort of how do you differentiate which is which? And I suspect that probably most of these termites, i.e. rotator cuffs, are caused from biologic factors, but some are caused from impingement. Um, so I do try to assess the acromial type um, preoperatively, intraoperatively. I sort of get a sense of if there's a spur that is really impinging with abduction. And then finally, if it's just a small rotator cuff and I just really can't see and I'm doing an acromioplasty for visualization, I, I, I certainly, that would probably account for 50% of my acromioplasties now or just for visualization. Pete, I almost I feel like we should just say a chromioplasty comment for you. Like, what, what are your just thoughts on where you, what do you do with the chromioplasties in your practice these days? Yeah, I mean, this was uh, our initial study, of course, uh, published about 10 years ago. Didn't show much of a difference, although there was even a trend towards higher reoperation rate in the neurochromioplasty group, even in the early study. Uh, but you could kind of interpret it one way or another because there's no difference in the quality of life scores. Um, a lot of the, uh, actually we got a lot of flack from people who thought acromioplasty did work and insurance companies might take this as a reason not to pay people for doing acromioplasties. And it's not the only study, there's many, many, many studies looking at this. Um, I would say that most of the studies, we analyze them carefully, there's not a lot of type three acromiums. There, you know, Gartzman's study, Tony Romeo's study, very few type three acromiums, one or two. So I think if, if you did another study, it would be a larger study just focusing on so-called type threes, and you can argue about the definition or increased critical shoulder angle, so on and so forth. So I think if you break those down, there's something to the whole impingement thing, but I would do acromioplasty probably in 75% of my cuff repairs now, just because if it's not because of impingement, it's because I just get better visualization, more room to do the repair. It just makes it technically easier. What about you? Like, what should, when do you do an acromioplasty? So Peter and I had the benefit of having the same mentor. And, uh, you know, I remember Dr. Hawkins saying, if uh, acromioplasties fail, I sure owe a lot of people a whole lot of money. <laughs> but for me, you know, I, I think, and Peter, I'll, I'll ask you this question um, after I, I answer yours. You know, I do perform a subacromial decompression, you know, as a, as a Hawkins and ear trained guy, but the way I do it has evolved over the years. You know, I, I don't do an extensive bursectomy. I minimally release the coracochromial cor ligament, and I just buff the anterior and lateral edge of the acromion. So minimally flattening the edges, basically what OK was saying, I'm trying to take out the impingement lesions. You know, Philippe Colleen has described really nicely the impingement lesions that occur in the subacromial space from that extrinsic pathology, regardless of chicken and egg. But Pete and Peter, in this study, how did you guys actually do technically the acromioplasty? I'd love to hear the other guys' options because I tend to buff just a little bit of the anterior edge and the, then the anterior lateral corner and a bit of the lateral edge. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, sometimes I'll walk into one of my colleagues' rooms and I'll watch them doing acromioplasty and it's completely different to a, you know how I was trained to do it by Rich Hawkins. So like when you're talking about chromioplasty, you might be talking about a wide spectrum of different operations. Uh, and that's why maybe it's so confusing trying to make sense out of this whole thing. Uh, I would, I wanna, my simple mission is to convert every chromium to type one chromium. So if it's type two, you're taking more. If it's type three, you're taking even more. So um, that's my mission, whether it means taking a little bit or a lot depends on the morphology of the chromium. So that's my short answer, Butch, to your, your question. <laughs> Just a quick follow up to that. That's incredibly important in the United States if you're trying to bill for a 29824 or a 29826, either one, because you actually have to demonstrate the verbiage that you're converting an acromion from one type to another. So I, I quote exactly that in my dictation. And if could I say two questions. Number one, if you start with a type one, would you bother even doing an acromioplasty? Ask the panel. It comes 
Did you say make it into a 0.75 from a one? Is that what you say? It, I did. I just <laughs> that was good. off that was a little good. bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, we haven't heard from you yet on this, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, wait, maybe yeah, I mean, good. there. I I do think there is some risk from over aggressive anterior acromioplasty, and you'll see those patients who basically have almost like a subtotal acromionectomy from aggressive treatment of that. And I I try to be a little bit judicious about that, especially in um, smaller women who you know doing a conversion of type two to type one or three to one would really thin out that anterior chromium. But in general, I mean, I think probably not much different than the rest of the pain. I try to be judicious about it. And if it's a really pristine arch and, you know, I have good visualization, um, but, you know, type two or type one, I'm not, I'm not do, doing anything about it. Um, type two or type three, if it really looks like there's an extrinsic impingement, then I'm pretty, I mean, I, I follow more like Peter's, um, way that he described of doing it, um, pretty aggressive. I, I even, I mean, I do things the way that Dr. Burkhart, um, taught me on the technical aspect. We, he would basically vaporize about a centimeter of the CA ligament. So not even just a release, but, you know, a resection almost, you know, like Dr. Near would have done open and, um, making a type one acromion, really visualizing it from like a lateral 30 degree view, um, with that type of um, bone block kind of cutting technique so that if you got an x-ray, you would see it, you know, be flat. So um, if I if I go for it, I really do the real deal and often remove some of the bone of the distal clavicle to try to coplane it to the level of the acromioplasty and just try to get a really nice open outlet. Can you comment on the 14% the higher retail rate in type threes? So like what, what are your thoughts on that finding? Me? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think, um, and this isn't the only study to demonstrate that. It, it's one of those things that, you know, we look for a clinical difference, but clinical outcome differences in rotator cuff surgery are hard to prove. I mean, we can barely even prove that healed cuffs are better than non-healed cuffs. So it's not a big surprise that you wouldn't have enough power in some of these studies to prove a clinical difference. So then you say, gosh, well, if there's a higher reoperation rate, I mean, that's at least something to hang your hat on and do it in a judicious fashion. So that's important to me. I, I think it, that it supports doing, I think that it supports doing it, um, you know, when it's structurally indicated. I have another question for the panel. What about uh, acute cuff tears? So you've got a gentleman who fell off a ladder. He's got a large cuff tear. He had no shoulder pain prior to that. Would you bother with acromioplasty? Is it necessary? Do you guys do it? I follow the same strategy as uh, Peter sort of stated in that case, just depends on the morphology. I'll be honest, sometimes it's, you know, I, in general, acromioplasties are safe. So the baseline is I, I feel like for the most part, I'm doing no harm. So if there's any question, I don't feel any sort of um, guilt about doing it. And also for training purposes, you know, it's a very nice thing for the residents who just sort of do lightly and they feel good about it. So, uh, but to your question, it depends on the morphology of the, um, the acromion. It's a, if it's a traumatic fall, I feel like it's not from impingement necessarily, it's from the injuries. I don't feel like I need to do it in every case. Which, what do you think? So interesting, you know, I, I really do try to individualize uh, and, and flatten the acromion as much as possible. And, you know, all joking aside, I probably take such a little amount of actual bone and I don't release the ligament that most people would probably say I don't do it. In acute cases, you know, I, I treat the same way as okay. That's what I was trying to say, Butch. Yeah, but, but the, <laughs> yeah, it was good, Rob, but the, the one group of patients that, that I actually am much more, uh, I guess, uh, in tune to disturbing as little as possible the subacromial milieu or the younger patients, the patients under the age of 40, under the age of 30. You know, we, we published a paper on patients under the age of 40 with, with cuff repairs. We didn't touch the acromion at all. We did what Dr. Near did, which is just a bursectomy and a cuff repair. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that, you know, I do so much less in the subacromial space now than I ever did because, you know, we don't know from the Mazaka studies and whatnot, Hans Utoff, the bursa heals. What are we doing? How are we uh, disturbing this? So I just try to get in and get out. Awesome point. So um, Dr. Duraldi has chimed in and said that he is a believer of acromioplasty. So former press, thank you for joining us as well as always.
All right, let's move on. To I hate to go on a tangent on this. This bursectomy issue is so interesting because I really have been paying close attention to that. And like the Burkhart, the cowboy way of doing shoulder arthroscopy is like, you know, you just visualize, you try to get pristine visualization, which in, includes very significant bursectomy. Um, and so, you know, I am so addicted to that as a surgeon and I want to like see the muscle tendon junction and all, you know, all the anatomy perfectly and just try to do. And I mean, I I'm trying to imagine a future where I do rotator cuff <laughs> surgery in the setting of an incomplete bursectomy. And it's like, you know, I just, I'm going crazy trying to imagine that scenario. So I hope it doesn't actually play. I hope that's just a fad for my own personal surgical practice. <laughs> that's an awesome point. All right. So let's move on to the next one. All right. So let's go to the revision cuff one next, because I think that's going to be um, a little bit more of a long discussion. So tell us arthroscopic revision cuff repair. Do tendons have a second chance to heal? And this study stated that few have investigated post-operative tendon tangery after reoperation for failed rotator cuff repairs. They state that the purpose of the study was to evaluate the anatomic and clinical outcomes of arthroscopic revision rotator cuff repairs to identify risk factors related to retears. They had 69 patients with a mean age of 55 who failed primary rotator cuff repair. Um, 38 were open and 62 were arthroscopic. Patients with massive cuff tears and humeral health elevation were excluded. Revision repairs were performed by a single surgeon. Single row was repaired, uh, was used 70% of the time and double row was 90% side to side 11 Primary outcome measures were tendon healing with MRI and CT arthrogram at one year. PROs were collected as well. There was a 36% non-healing rate, which was associated with poor functional outcome and decreased PROs. Factors negatively associated with tendon healing were age over 55, tendon retraction in stage, uh, of stage two or higher, and fatty infiltration index greater than two. There was no difference in retail rates between single and double rows. 36% of uh, shoulders uh, were cultured were CACNES positive, interestingly. 25% had unsatisfactory clinical results, and 22 were dissatisfied, and 5.7% uh, underwent reoperation. So, this study concluded that even with careful patient selection and complete coverage of the footprint, 36% cases of re revision cuffs did not heal and were associated with poor outcomes. Patients over 55 stage two tears and fatty infiltration of greater than two had lower uh, healing rates. So uh, no, let's just let's start with Butch this time. Butch, does this match your your results for revision rotator cuffs? Well, you know, it's uh, it's hard to say something uh, that's a little bit uh, different from my mentor who wrote this paper, but I, I think we have to be really careful when we're talking again, just like a chromioplasty with techniques. So we said single row, we said double row, but what Pascal does is actually effectively a deep partial repair in that he puts his single row tendon anchor on the lateral aspect of the tuberosity and passes stitches through in a basically a horizontal U. So the undersurface of the cuff is actually not attached at the tendocapsular footprint where the articular surface joins greater tuberosity. So effectively, it almost creates a deep partial repair. And Jeff Abrams, Buddy Savo, and others have, have reported extensively on the necessity, oftentimes in revision repairs, of the fact that the tendon is no longer the same medial lateral length. And effectively, if you want to try to have something to heal to the bone, whether it's fiber, fatty tissue, or whatever you want to call it, you have to medialize the tension on the repair. So, uh, you know, I, I might take a little bit of uh, a different approach that I think with the right patient selection, our results on revision repair are probably the same as our results of primary repair, which is, you know, effectively somewhere in the order of 80% uh, of the tendons heal. So maybe not quite as high a failure rate as this. Could I, oh, I wanted to throw out a different question. The Gutelier classification, I wonder what the panelists think about the uh, difficulty in classifying that. We know that with a certain amount of medialization, that affects how we measure and that uh, it, it may be throwing off our measurements. In other words, you may be thinking that you're getting more atrophy when in reality you have a medialization of the tendon. Sometimes we don't always get MRIs that go far enough medial. What, what are the panelists' thoughts about that in terms of how useful it makes the Gutelier classification? And are you routinely, do you ever question it be, because of those measurement factors? Rob, do you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, one? I, so... I try not to, in in the 
in the, it's such a difficult question. In the normal clinical scenario of where I'm evaluating a patient um, for, let's just say specifically in the setting where they might be a candidate for a revision rotator cuff repair. So it's someone who, you know, is a joint preservation candidate and they're younger and, you know, it's, ob it's obvious that you wouldn't just go to a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So I try not to bias myself on using Goutalier as like the single factor to use in the decision-making process. Cause I think that's where trying to be metacognitive about my own, you know, decision-making it's like, if it doesn't look good on that one, on that one parasagittal T1 image that I just write them off. And I mean, that goes the, the same thing I think could be said for the decision-making process for primary rotator cuff surgery is, that for the right patient, what I like to do is look for, look for good muscle, not look for the absence of muscle. So like, I'll look at the other T1 sequences, because typically there's at least another one available, like in our imaging center, they get coronal images. So if the muscle belly is retracted, you can get it on the coronal images on the T1. So I try to look for muscle and sort of give the patient the benefit of the doubt, um, all other things being equal. I mean, and it's so difficult, the decision-making with these complex tears, because you're trying to take into account size and retraction and patient physiology and blah, blah, blah all the stuff that we do. And so I just, you know, that's my thought about it is to just throw out there it's easy to use that as a single factor and just look at that one image and say, nope, this patient's not a candidate for um, for rotator cuff surgery, primary or revision. And I think it takes a little bit of effort to resist that. So, okay, do you change your technique for revision repair or do you just do the same technique that you did the first time and just kind of hope it works? Um, uh, great question. I do, I changed my technique um, I mean, I think a, a lot more about um, muscle uh, tendon length relationship. Um, I do more single rows, but um, not as um, apparently described in this paper. Um, I'm very interested, even though I haven't started, but I am interested in considering more biologic options, whether it's some sort of scaffold, you know, whether it's a bi-inductive over the rotator cuff, like, um, and I don't want to go into company names or the others that are placed on the antithesis. Uh, but I think that might make a difference. Um, I, I think less compression may be better. I think the vasculature is likely more tenuous. Um, so I think less compression, if possible, um, repairing it on tension, and I do more single rows. Great. Um, oh, uh, Butch, what do you think of the infection uh, data in this paper? Do you think that retears are commonly due to Subtle uh, C. acne's infection, how aggressive? Symptomatic re tears, right? Symptomatic I mean, that's -tears, yeah. or symptomatic non healing. That's the whole yeah. issue with this, right? Is these patients yeah. were symptomatic. P Peter, this, this is a huge point, and to the point that I, you know, I firmly agree that a lot of these patients that we think didn't heal or failed, whether they're with soft tissue surgery or any type of metallic or arthroplasty surgery, we are hyper aggressive at investigating for infection. We really are. Every single one of these patients who has any type of prior surgery, we do serologic indices, uh, aspirations. And, you know, while it might be neither here nor there and apples and oranges as to whether we actually get a diagnosis, invariably you'll find, you may find something in, in a patient, one or two, that is, is just not quite right. And this piggybacks on our arthroplasty experience because we found when we reviewed our series of infections in primary arthroplasties, Patients who had a prior soft tissue failed surgery had a, a statistically higher risk of infection than those who did not. So then we went back and looked at our failed soft tissues and found that we had a higher risk of infection than just, you know, virgin shoulders. So I don't think you should discount this. I also don't think, uh, you know, you got to throw the baby out with the bath water. And if you're concerned about somebody potentially having a subclinical infection, I have no problem putting them on a simple uh, doxycycline minocycline regimen for a short period of time prior to operating on them and continuing that afterwards. So just an extension, extension of that, but should, if you're considering that infection might be a possibility when you re-repair it, will you avoid putting a graft in or are you worried about that? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's not germane to this panel necessarily, but, you know, I don't use anchors when I repair the cuff, haven't for the last 15 years, 17 years. And I use semi-permanent sutures. Uh, 
So if I think there's an infection in any kind of revision repair that, that we did not perform, I remove all permanent suture material. I don't remove the anchors, obviously, unless they're, they're prominent for any reason, but I, I don't use any type of, uh, of grafting material, whether it's synthetic or uh, autograft or xenograft. Nice. Hey, Butch, Rob, what about so ASC? Do you, do you do these cases hospital-based or ASC-based mostly? Because for me, that makes a big difference in the ability to get good cultures. I mean, Yeah, so actually our ASC is within our hospital. Mm. Is, so it's, it's the same lab. But I right. totally get the point. And so, uh, you know, for instance, in my prior life, when, uh, you know, I was at a, a purely private practice place, it was impossible because you have to send the cultures off. I mean, it's really, really hard to do. And as, you know, the majority of things that we do are outpatient, that's a really difficult thing. And I think if you, if you think they're infected, you better believe they're infected because it's hard to prove it. For me, the idea that all all revision rotator cuff repairs are infected until proven otherwise, which is sort of what you know is state I can't is that actually stated in this paper? I can't remember, but it would be a big game changer for my revision practice because I just I would take them all to the hospital because in our ASC I don't trust the ability to get good good fourteen day extended cultures. They get lost. They throw them out at three days that, you know, I'm not sure what's happened between taking that culture and it eventually getting to the lab, who knows, five days later, it just, you know, I, I would convert all these patients to hospital if I adopted this philosophy, which I, which may be reasonable. I mean, I, I think there's really something to the fact that the, these patients are a unique subset of structurally non-healed repairs in which that they were symptomatic enough to get care and get repeat surgery. So maybe it is that we should consider all patients who classify in that way as infected until proven otherwise. Yeah, I always take the stance if it didn't work the first time and you feel like you got a reasonably good technically sound repair, you did everything right, then why would it work the second time? There's got to be something going on. There's a intrinsic biology infection. Something is a mess. And so I think you, sh you should probably change your approach second time. And why aren't they a coper? Exactly. Yeah, maybe they're infected at 30%. Yeah, and, and I just want to, you know, so Matt, you know, to your point earlier with revisions, you know, one thing, you know, I think we've sort of looked at, you know, is collecting, we've collected sort of like biopsies of the muscle in patients, and you sort of use that as a gold standard, like, okay, you get a biopsy, and then you see how much fat there is, theoretically, it should be more direct than the Goutelier. And then we've looked at sort of the Goutelier classification and tendon retraction. Um, and tendon retraction actually correlates more closely with what you see on histology in terms of muscle fat. So in revision settings now, I mean, I will still look at the Gitalia classification, like you said, but I tend to just trust the amount of tendon retraction. Um, you know, if it's retracted significantly, I actually give that more um, importance than what I see in the scap Y image or vice versa. Yeah, if you haven't read Oki's papers on basic science, uh, fatty infiltration, they're, they're fantastic. Um, Matt, um, what, what do you think about biologics? I know Oki mentioned it and, and Butch um, mentioned it as well. Do you ever augment with biologics after revisions? Yeah, it was interesting. I was, I was debating whether we should bring that topic up because that's an entire webinar or maybe more. But, um, you know, there's a full spectrum out there. There are people who are literally advocating this for everything. I mean, there are some people who are using this in every partial thickness rotator cuff tear, which I, if I could use the word, I think is obscene. Um, I, I have kind of relegated it predominantly to revision cases if I think it's, if I think it's doable. Sometimes it's, I don't even think it's worthwhile, just technical, you know, circumstances or whatnot. Um, or if it's a revision, for instance, um, occasionally I have a revision where it's someone who, I'll give you an example. I had a guy recently who we did his cuff, fixed it fine, was doing great. Two months after he felt so good that he decided to lift a 40 pound box of books and he retore his cuff. So that to me was a traumatic retear or traumatic failure to heal, so to speak. Um, in that case, the tissue was good enough to repair. I didn't need any extra tissue. I think biologically it was pretty much the same as it was Prior to that, I didn't necessarily use a patch, um, but there are other times in revision cases, and that's how I justify it, you know, a $5,000 cost, for instance, to say, well, if I think there's some biological reason or it needs some kind of extra tissue or extra biology, I will, but I haven't gone to the point of using it 
on every large tear. I, I think there's a lot from what I know of some of the companies out there, there are, there are a fair number of randomized studies that are in progress. And you know, there's probably a lot more people who, who know more about it than I do. Um, but certainly the cost is al always gives me pause because you know we're we're charged with being good stewards. If we're not, then you know eventually it's going to come back to bite us. So um, you know my my little corner of practice has sort of kept them in in the revision circumstance uh, to some degree. I have not used them uh, much, you know, primarily. Rob, Pete, any other comments on biologics before we move on to the next uh, article? Yeah, I mean, it, personally, I, I like using uh, patches in the revision situation. I don't use them in the primary. I do find that the other subset of patients I have trouble with is the partial rotator cuff tears that are very symptomatic, and I don't really have a good solution to those. So I tend to use patches in that situation. But those are the. Yeah, but you'd certainly, to Butch's point, want to work people up for infection probably more than we actually all do, because it's a. Uh, something that probably flies under the radar screen quite a bit. My reading on the literature on, on dermal augmentation in the revision setting is it doesn't seem to improve the healing rate more than revision repair without. So I have not really done that very often. And I think it's reasonable based on what we know to offer PRP or BMAC. I mean, for based on what we know about primary repair and the ability to get better healing. Um, that's my take. Awesome. All right. So let's move on to the last study. Um, switching gears to non-operative patients and to Rob's point, like who copes well and who doesn't. So this was a study called the predictors of failure of non-operative treatment of chronic symptomatic full thickness rotator cuff tears. This was the 2013 NEAR award. The purpose of the study was to help define the indications for rotator cuff repair by identifying predictors of failure of non-operative treatment. This was a prospective, prospective multi-center study. All patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears on MRI were offered inclusion. Acute uh, cuff tears were excluded. Data was obtained to determine the risk factors for failing standard rehabilitation protocols, which was defined as patients undergoing surgery. Variables analyzed were tear severity, age, activity level, body mass index, sex, SANE scores, visual analog scores for pain, education, headness, comorbidities, duration of symptoms, strength, employment, smoking status, and patient education. Roughly 20% uh, failed non-operative treatment. The strongest predictor of failure of non-operative treatment was patient expectations regarding physical therapy, along with higher activity level and not smoking. They concluded that the decision to undergo surgery is influenced by low expectations regarding the effectiveness of PT over patient symptoms and anatomic features of the rotator cuff uh, tears. So Pete, you had the most experience of this group. What do you make of the, the patient's um, perception of PT and, and that association with failing non-operative management? Yeah, I mean... Like up in Canada, we have a built-in period of PT because of waitlist. So we kind of, you know, we find that our patients weed themselves out. By the time we've seen them, they failed everything, injections, PT, you name it. So uh, we we kind of- Does that default. include acute? P I'm sorry to interrupt. Did, like an acute rotator cuff tear that comes in, are they put in that bucket too, or they just have to do physical therapy? No, acute massive cuff tear, we would see right away, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. but uh, These more are chronic, the chronic tears. tears. Yeah. Chronic yeah. tears, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we've kind of been following this for years and, you know, definitely, obviously there's rotator cuffs everywhere in the population and we all only operate on a small subset. So uh, we got to weed them out better. We send them to PT, but what is PT? Like PT is different. It's kind of like apples and oranges. What, what is an acromioplasty? There's uh, all sorts of different types of expertise and therapists in dealing with rotator cuff, whether they put hot packs on, whether they do a rotator cuff specific program of exercises. So I think that probably needs to be better defined in some of these studies. But anyways, there's there's really, there's merit to the fact that we need to, a lot of these patients will get better on their own and, and weeding them out and predictive factors are the hard part. What, okay, what patient characteristics do you find do best with non-operative treatment? Have you noticed in your practice a, a certain patient that will do really well with non-operative treatment and will cope really well, like Rob says, or some that you would indicate quicker? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think this is a, you know, sort of a landmark, landmark study that allowed us to think a lot about non-operative treatment. And one thing I've always sort of felt about the study is that there's a bit of a selection bias 
I mean, these are patients who come in sort of willing and motivated to agree to do a study on non-operative treatment, which is different than what we see in our practices. So that would be sort of the first consideration would be the patient expectation that the patient is one that literally comes in and just they just do not want surgery. And that's the patient that will generally probably be okay or have a higher chance of doing well uh, versus someone who comes in with a full thickness tear and me saying that, you know, you're going to be fine non-operatively. Um, because the studies that have been sort of non-controlled, which technically are worse, um, but actually in my practice, more realistic, have shown, you know, about 50 to 60% of those patients end up wanting to have surgery within a year if they have symptomatic full thickness rotator cuff tear. And secondly, one thing that I do agree with is the patient's perception of physical therapy. So at this point, if a patient shows any pushback for PT, I just tell them that it's likely not going to work. Rob, what are your thoughts as well? I'd love to hear. Yeah, as someone who yeah. talked about the, the patient who can cope and not cope throughout this entire webinar, right. uh, have you somewhat- Yeah, I mean, I love Oki's point that only you know half of the patients that were screened for, for being included were you know included in this 422. So you're already talking about a set of people who would do the study, blah, blah, blah. Then the people who likely did well were people who were the most enthusiastic. So then they're like a sub subset of people that, like, what I where I get enthusiastic for non surgical treatment when it's obviously chronic, you know, no injury component whatsoever. I think where it's difficult is when there's you know it's an acute on chronic scenario and you're trying to figure out what to do about that problem. But and it's clearly an older patient, but that is an older patient who is like sort of enthusiastic about exercise and they like going to therapy. They've been to therapy for their arthritic knee, whatever. And those are the people who I think it's really important to give them a good shot at it and make sure the therapy's done well by an experienced therapist and, you know, encourage them that if it doesn't work, there's other options and things. And then you try to eliminate people from surgery who, like Butch said, a rotator cuff tear is just a natural part of their life and their shoulder getting older and they're going to be fine. But are there any roles for injections in your non operative treatment of rotator cuffs? No, actually, I have pretty strong feelings about this because, you know, the we all know the detrimental effect of cortisone, not only on, you know, on chondrocytes, but also on the tuberosity, the actual, you know, density of bone, tendon itself, so on and so forth. Our Japanese uh, traveling fellows who were here, and Peter met them well, Tomonori actually talked about what happens and what generates pain with rotator cuff tears. And it's interesting that the, uh, the inflammatory markers in the subacromial space for pain are totally different from the inflammatory markers that cause joint pain in hips and knees. And they found that actually non-steroidal anti-inflammatories were actually terrible and consequently led us to stop using non-steroidals. And we've, we've started moving towards Tylenol, but oral steroids are actually very beneficial to break the inflammatory pain cycle. So I have no hesitation using a medrol dose pack. Uh, I've learned that from our rheumatology colleagues, but I really hesitate against uh, putting a cortisone shot to someone who I know has a, a structural cuff tear because of the unknown progression that, that can cause. Pete, you have a lot of experience with that just based on how long it takes patients to get time to get surgery in Canada, having steroids. What, what's your overall thoughts on your patient's experience with steroids? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the non-operative, you know, the primary care physicians and a lot of them patients come in with rotator cuff tears who have had injections already. I counsel them that, you know, one injection may be okay, but repeated injections are not good, not healthy as Butch outlined in the long term. And then the other thing is you don't want to do it too close to surgery. There's some circumstantial evidence that that's going to increase your infection rate. Although Kevin Plancher had a recent paper to show that that may not be the case in his experience. But I think you have to be cognizant of the repeated doses of uh, steroid injection in the subacromial space causing detrimental effects to uh, long-term rotator cuff health. And uh, so I, I'm not advocating for that. I wonder if anybody can comment on this as well. I, I sometimes get patients, I had one today actually, who they often have an experience in another joint. For instance, uh, they've had a knee or a hip problem and they've been offered therapy or they've been offered injections. And you talk about some of those same treatments with their shoulder, for instance, 
and they they'll say something like, oh yeah, that doesn't work for me. You know, therapy doesn't work for me. It didn't do anything for my knee. So I wonder, you know, what people's thoughts are on that, how much of people's interactions with the healthcare system in general or other musculoskeletal problems, complaints, and experiences with treatments with that, how that influences it. Um, and maybe also how well they know their own body. I mean, sometimes people just know that certain things do work for them or don't work for them, or they know their own motivational level and coming in. So I wonder what people's thoughts are on that. Okay. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that, you know, it, it's, you know, there are a number of reasons why a patient would not want to do physical therapy. And usually, you know, some of it is truth based on a physical therapist. Some of them is, you know, based on their perception, maybe they weren't as compliant, et cetera, et cetera. And then I started to feel that, you know, ultimately their perception is their perception. And I believe that for them to do well, they'll certainly need physical therapy. So regardless of why they feel how they feel, if I get to the point that their perception of physical therapy is that it's not going to be helpful, I tend to just steer them away from the operative treatment. But I do tell them that after surgery, you would need physical therapy, but I find that patients are a little bit more compliant and willing to do things after surgery than pre-op. Um, and finally, just to add, I always let the patients know that even with non-operative treatment, you might do fine, but over the years, you're going to have better functional outcomes, as has been shown with surgery than without surgery. So you may be fine, but you're probably better with surgery, and you likely would have an increase in tear size over the years. Yeah, I think that that's a great point, especially with a younger patient under age 55. I tell my patients, you, you know, if you come back in 10 years, that tear for sure is going to be quite a bit bigger. And though it's easily fixable right now, it may not be so in 10 years. So is there any role for physiotherapy in acute traumatic tears, Butch? Oh, that's a really tough question for me because, uh, you know, I have a strong bias against actual formal physiotherapy and acute traumatic tear, because I think they're, you know, we know that that's a different group. It's a different population. They have a higher incidence of acute uh, or concomitant neurologic pathology. And, you know, if the cuff is denervated because they have a transient suprascapular neuropathy, man, you can extend the tear by having a physiotherapist work on that. So personally for me, I would rather they just function as they can in normal life than sending them to someone that Right, potentially could turn a reparable tear into an irreparable or very difficult to heal tear. Good points. So how quickly is, so Butch, uh, along those lines, how quickly do you get to traumatic rotator cuff tears? Are you, are you trying to get them ASAP? Do you have a time cutoff when you when you think that they're going to be less repairable? Yeah, it's interesting. If we review the literature, we're doomed to repeat it, right? Uh, Rick Bassett, Bob Cofield reported years ago, back in the 1980s, fix them within the first four weeks, best results. Larry Higgins then redid the study, fix them within the first four weeks, get the best results. Recent paper last year, fix them within the first four weeks, get the results. So, I mean, I, I, I'm a simple guy. If I can get, if they come to me and they're within four weeks of injury and it's a true acute tear, I'll rearrange my schedule and get them on as soon as possible. Maybe we could go down the line of the guys because we have one minute left. Does, does the panel all feel within four weeks is the appropriate time to fix a traumatic rotator cuff? Anyone feel differently? Rob? Yeah, I like fixing them early. Matt? I would just say ASAP. It doesn't, my schedule doesn't always work out within four weeks because sometimes they get to you later, but ASAP. Okay, you're booked out for years. I don't think you could possibly do that uh -huh. if you wanted to, but if you could, would you? Uh, eight weeks. Eight weeks for me, um, a little longer than four. Yeah. What about you, Pete? Yeah, if I can get them in within four weeks, I think it's a good good benchmark. It's uh, they do it's just kind of like a first time shoulder desiccation, that nice juicy bank cart. Fixing that is just so much more gratifying. The tissues uh, a better quality. It's mobile. There's no you don't have to do a lot of releasing. Just slap it down, repair it, and usually it heals. Well, awesome. Well, that brings us to our hour. Um, you know, thank you, every so everyone. We had such a great discussion as always. Rob, Matt, Oki, Pete, and Butch, like, you know, what a great discussion. I know everyone who is online will enjoy it and everyone who's going to be watching it or viewing it uh, on demand uh, really enjoyed all the conversation. So thank you so much for a great webinar. Thank you, guys. Thanks, y'all. Thank, thank you. you. It was great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.